so we'll talk about uh, uh, dichotomy theorems for counting constraint satisfaction problems. And uh, I think David referred it to Sander. Uh, I would probably call it uh, like a hammer result, like it has a lot of power. You can use it to hit a lot of things, but uh, it's not like very delicate. There are things that you cannot uh, explain, um, which we'll see at about the end of the talk. Um, but I will just flash through all these definitions, which we have seen uh, multiple times. So uh, just, just to make sure we're on the same page about the notation. So D is the domain, and uh, a language is just a um, set of relations. Uh, and an instance of a counting constraint satisfaction problem is something like this. You have a bunch of variables, and you can apply relations from the language on these variables. Uh, and the decision problem asks whether it's uh, empty or not. Uh, and there were these examples. And there are these different problems we can ask, you know, decision optimization, including the valued uh, constraint satisfaction problems with weights. And we're interested in the counting problem in this talk. So the same setup, the only difference is that we're interested in computing the size of R, how many uh, tuples are there that can satisfy all the constraints. Uh, and these are the corresponding counting problems. Um, and we can generalize it to uh, include weights. So now the language consists of uh, functions. Uh, given an instance, we can define a function over n variables, which is just take the product of all the constraint functions. Uh, and our goal is to compute this partition function, which is the sum over all possible assignments. Okay. Um, and the counting graph homomorphism problems or partition function we talked about is the very special case when L consists of a single uh, symmetric and binary function. Uh, and the uh, unweighted uh, counting CSP is the special case when the function, when every function takes uh, uh, zero one values. Okay. And we have this uh, a sequence of uh, dichotomy theorems for counting CSP. Uh, so the first uh, dichotomy is by Andrei Bulatov for uh, for all the counting CSP, uh, unweighted counting CSP, and the, uh, it's a typical dichotomy theorem. Every such uh, problem. Uh, is either solvable in polynomial time or shall be complete. And then we have an alternative proof by Dyer and Richard B. And uh, a feature of the proof is uh, it gives an alternative tractability criterion, which is equivalent to the original one, but can be now shown to be decidable in MP. Uh, and then it was further extended to uh, non-negative rational languages uh, by Bulatov and O, and then to non-negative uh, algebraic languages. Uh, and then with Jingyi, we proved the dichotomy theorem for uh, all the languages, including those with uh, complex weights. So here is the, uh, the plan of the, of the talk. I will spend, uh, I think, most of the time, like 80% of the time, uh, to give you uh, I think a pretty detailed proof of the dichotomy theorem for unweighted or zero one uh, CSP, counting CSP. And most of the time, or, uh, we're going to focus on the algorithm part uh, because that's, that's, that turns out to be the most difficult part uh, compared to the hardness part, which is very different from uh, counting graph homomorphisms where uh, I think hardness part is more difficult compared to the algorithm part. Uh, so we'll talk about the tractability criterion and uh, techniques uh, like polymorphisms Andre talked about in the morning. We'll see one particular example called Marchev polymorphism and why having such a polymorphism helps you get a very useful uh, algorithm. Uh, and then we'll see uh, what we can do to extend it to non-negative and even uh, complex valued uh, counting CSP. So let's start with a very simple definition. Uh, so we have a, a non-negative matrix 
and we say it's uh, rectangular, uh, if, uh, if you can basically permute the rows and columns and make it block rank one, make it look like this, and uh, every block, um, every entry in each block is positive. And equivalently, you can define it as the following. You can take any two sub, two by two sub matrix of this bigger matrix. And, you know, if this two by two matrix has three positive entries, then the other entry must also be positive. So just note here that we don't really care about, you know, the values of the entries. All we care about is which entries are positive and which entries are zero. And the next condition or next definition, uh, um, we care about the entries, um, and we call non-active matrix uh, a block rank one matrix if it is rectangular, and in addition, every block is a rank one matrix. Okay. So for example, this is not a block rank one matrix because this is not rank one. You have to you know, fix it to make it a block rank one matrix. And in the talk, I will use a picture like this to, to denote a block rank one matrix. Uh, as we'll see in this talk, we're interested in mostly uh, matrices like this, like very skewed. We have a lot of rows, but only uh, little d many columns. Little d is the size of the domain. And these will be the blocks. Each one is positive and rank one. And outside of these blocks, it's all zero. And now let's um, talk about the tractability criterion and state uh, the dichotomy theorem. Uh, so here are some of the matrices we're interested in in the definition of strong balance, the tractability criterion. So uh, let's fix the language that we're interested in. And now take any CSP instance, and then uh, you get a relation. You know, the instance defines a relation, let's say, over n variables. Now you partition the variables in, you know, into three piles. You know, let's say the first k variables is part one. Then you have the next l variables and the rest r variables. And then it defines for us a matrix M. Uh, the rows of the matrix is indexed by uh, U, the uh, you know, a k tuple. Uh, columns are indexed by V, a l tuple. And the UV entry is the number of ways to um, complete this tuple to make it uh, a string, a tuple in the relation R. So it's a non-active integer, um, and that's, that's the matrix M. So there are a lot of you know, infinite and many such matrices because you have infinite and many uh, instances, and uh, you can also pick the, uh, any partition you want. Here is the first condition called strongly rectangular, uh, and the language is strongly rectangular if every such matrix you get in this way is uh, a rectangular matrix. Okay. And the second condition is stronger. It says that every such matrix is uh, block rank one. It's rectangular and it's also block rank one. Um, now, the condition of strong balance is equivalent to congruence singularity used in uh, Bulatov's dichotomy theorem. Um, it's also pretty clear that strong balance implies strong rectangularity, and you can actually construct an example to show that uh, it's not the other direction. Okay. And now we're able to state the dichotomy theorem in more details. Uh, in Bulatov's dichotomy theorem uh, shows that you know, if the language is congruent singular, then it's in P. Uh, you can solve it efficiently, otherwise it's sharply hard. Uh, and uh, later it was shown that if it's strongly balanced by Dyer and Richard B, and then it's in P, otherwise it's, it's sharply hard. Okay. Now, the hardest part of the proof is, is uh, relatively uh, simple compared to the uh, the algorithm part. Uh, you basically do a graph gadget reduction um, and uh, have a reduction from uh, the graph homomorphism problem over a non-negative matrix 
to this CSP and then show that this matrix is actually uh, violates the condition of Bulatov growth. Okay, it has a two by two sub matrix that's not rank one. So we're going to focus on the algorithm part of the dichotomy theorem, which says that if you have a language that is strong, strongly balanced, then I want to use this property to uh, give an efficient algorithm. Um, so here is the first uh, technique that we're going to use, which is uh, polymorphisms that Andre talked about in the morning. And here I mean the definition I restrict this map to be ternary because that's all we are going to use in the talk. So um, just repeat the definition. Um, polymorphism is the map such that uh, here you can take any three strings in the relation, and then you can do this operation, you know, component-wise, you apply the map, and you get a new tuple. And the property is that this new tuple should also be in the, in the relation. If the original three tuples are in the relation. Okay. We'll see this picture probably, such a picture like three, four, five times in the talk. Uh, just, just because I, I think at the beginning when I first see this definition, like I, I have complete no idea what's going on. Uh, even today, I don't think I, I can use it, but I still don't have a very good understanding. Uh, but hopefully after a few examples, we can see that when you have a language that has uh, polymorphism, at least the polymorphism that we're going to see, the so-called Melcher polymorphism, it gives you some very useful uh, efficient algorithms that can, you, can be used to understand um, uh, relations. So what is the Melcher polymorphism? It's a polymorphism, but in addition, it just it satisfies this condition, which is like the opposite of uh, a majority. So when you have a, B, B, the result is A, and when you have B, B, A, the result is also A. Okay, that's the only condition uh, on the polymorphism, and this should hold for all A, B, including like A equals B. And more generally, we say uh, a language has a much of polymorphism C, if it's a, a, it's a polymorphism, multi-check polymorphism for every relation in the language. Now, just let's do some exercises about, you know, um, multi-check polymorphism and, and, and get better at it. So the first, here is the first observation. Let's prove it. Uh, if you have a language, gamma, and C is a multi-check polymorphism, and I claim that you can, you know, construct any CSP instance and get a bigger relation, and this bigger relation should also has per se as a, as a multi polymorphism. Okay. So, for example, let's say this is the CS, CSP instance, uh, and I want to prove that the same multi polymorphism should also work for this this relation. Okay. So, by definition, you just take three tuples that are in this relation. And then we apply the Marchev polymorphism component-wise. And I claim that the result should also in the relation because we can look at each of the constraints individually. So let's focus on the first constraint. We know that these three tuples are in the relation. So U1, U2, U3 should satisfy the relation. V, V1, V2, V3 should be in the relation. The same for W. So I'll forget about the first component after applying the Marchev polymorphism these uh, three entries should give me a uh, tuple in the relation theta one. And you can do this for each of the constraints uh, and can conclude that this is also uh, a tuple that is in the relation R that satisfies all the constraints. Okay. Now, the other thing is uh, the following two things are actually equivalent. Uh, gamma is strongly rectangular is the equivalent to uh, gamma having a much of polymorphism. Okay. So uh, what this tells us is that, okay, 
we, we are working on the algorithm part. So we are assuming that gamma satisfies the strong balance condition, which implies strong rectangularity. Uh, and by this theorem, we would know that uh, gamma also has a, a much f polynomial. And actually, you can assume that you are given this much of polymorphism because the language is, is a finite fixed thing. You can actually go through all the possible maps and check whether one of them is a much of polymorphism. Now, there were, of course, two directions we need to prove here. Uh, I'll just do the easier direction. The other is more difficult, much more difficult than this direction. But at least we can see you know, what's the connection between these two. Um, so the easier direction says, let's say gamma has a much of polymorphism, C, and I want to show that it's strongly re rectangular. Okay. So remember what's the definition of strongly rectangular? It means that you can take any CSB instance and get a relation R. And then you just do a partition of the variables into three parts um, using, let's say, K and L. Uh, now, here is what we need to show. We want to show that if a two by two matrix uh, submatrix of this matrix M has three positive entries, let's call them uh, U prime V, U V, and U V prime, then the other entry, U prime V prime, should also be positive. Okay. Now, what it means for an entry to be positive, it means there is a way to complete this tuple to get a string in R. So this is what we can say about U prime V. You now we can put something here so that it's in R. We don't really uh, care about these W strings. For the same for UV and the same for UV prime. And actually, it's it's you know you should be careful about how you put these. What's the order you put these three strings? Now, then you just apply the much of polymorphism. And you should get a new string that is also in the relation. And by the property of the much of polymorphism, the first entry should be u1 prime. Uh, so we will get u prime. And then we'll get v prime. Okay. So we know that u prime, v prime also has a way to you know, concatenate something and uh, get a tuple in R. So u prime, v prime is also a positive entry. Uh, and as a result, this matrix should be rectangular. Now, the next thing is uh, that when you have a relation that has a much of polymorphism, there is actually a, a highly succinct way to encode this relation. And uh, actually, this, this representation can help you answer a lot of questions about this relation. But to get there, uh, let's just understand the uh, a relation that has a much of polymorphism a little bit, you know, deeper. So let's say R is a relation that has C as a much of polymorphism. Um, so we're interested in the projection of R onto the ice coordinate. Um, you just it just contains all the elements in the domain that you can, that has the string uh, in the language, sorry, in the relation, and has the ice coordinate being A. Uh, and later we'll actually naturally, I mean, it's natu pretty natural to call such a string a witness that A is in the projection of R on the uh, ice coordinate. We'll call such a string a witness for this fact. And then we can define this relation uh, over the projection. And two elements, A and B, are um, in the relation if there is a way to uh, complete, uh, you know, put something on the left and put something on the right, you get a string in R. And there is also a same, same thing you can do for B. And uh, they actually have the same, you know, uh, J minus one prefix. The W W prime can be different, can be the same. It doesn't matter. But uh, as long as you can put the same prefix before A and before B, and get something in the relation, then we say A and B are in this relation. 
And here is an important lemma that um, will lead us to the succinct representation, which says that if R has a much of polymorphism, then this is actually an equivalence relation. And let's just use the uh, same picture again to prove this. Uh, and the goal here is let's say A and B are in the relation, B and C are also in the relation. We want to show that A and C are in the relation. Okay, just, just plug in the definition. What does A and B uh, in the relation means is that there are these two strings with the same prefix and both in the relation R. For B and C, there are also these two strings with the same prefix, and they're in the relation R. And U, U prime can be different in general. And then you just put these, uh, I think, three of them in the right direction, so uh, in the right order. So U A V followed by U B V and U prime B W. And in the first part, we would get U prime. Then we would get A followed by some W string. So what does this tell us? This tells us that there is a string starts with U prime A and it's in R. But we also know there is a string U prime C that is in R. So by definition, it tells us that A and C are also in the relation. Okay. And this is the equivalence relation, okay. which we'll see uh, that plays a really important role in, in the whole proof. Now, here is the really important definition called witness functions. I think you first uh, used in Dyer and Richard B. And it's similar to the compact representation used in Bulatov and Delmo. Um, and the point is it's, it's highly succinct, meaning that uh, you just need polynomial many bits to describe this witness function. But on the other hand, it basically contains all the information about a relation R. And actually, it can, in polynomial time, uh, tell you something you cannot directly um, compute using R. Okay. So, um, uh, with this function, maps a pair, uh, an integer between 1 and n, basically a, a coordinate index, and uh, an element in the domain to either a string, uh, an n-tuple, or nil. And the first line, two lines, basically tell you that if A is in the projection of R on the ice coordinate, then omega IA, sorry, if it's not in the projection, then omega IA should tell you that by, um, by setting the entry to be nil. And if it's in the, in the projection, then it should give you a witness. It should give you a, a tuple in the relation and have its ice coordinate being A. So if, if I have a, such a function, at least I can tell very quickly uh, whether, you know, what is the projection on each coordinate very quickly. You just look at those entries, which entries are nil, which entries are not. Now, this is really important property, which we only can ask for something like this because of, you know, this is an equivalence relation. So this condition says that if a and B are in the same equivalent class, then these two witnesses for A and B respectively, given, by, given to you by the witness function, should share the same I minus one prefix. So, so what does the witness function look like? First of all, if you have, let's say, I A, and A is not in the projection, then it, it's always nil. Now, for those in the projection, because we have an equivalence relation, we can divide them into equivalent classes. And for strings in the, for, for, for elements uh, that are in the same equivalent class, their witness function, their, uh, their witness should share the same prefix, I minus one prefix. And this is a lemma which tells us why you know, it's, it's so useful. Um, the first lemma says that if I have a 
uh, witness function for a relation R, uh, then you can basically throw away this relation R because I can answer membership queries using this relation. You know, if you give me any n tuple, I can tell you whether it is in the relation or not. And it's, it's very useful because this relation is in general, I mean, um, has arity n, but on the other hand, a uh, witness function basically contains, uh, roughly speaking, n times little d many tuples. So it's much shorter than, um, say, the size of the relation. Now the second lemma says that it actually can compute something for you uh, very efficiently that, um, that, that not clear how to do it otherwise. So again, we have a uh, witness function, but now we're given a string, um, we're given a t tuple u, and it turns out that we can use this witness function to tell whether this tuple is in the projection of r uh, onto the first t coordinates. It can tell you whether there is a way to complete uh, a tuple using this as a prefix and put it in the relation r. And here is how, you, how, how we prove these two lemmas. Let, let's focus on this one and it will become just natural, like you know, it implies that you can also do the same algorithm to get this lemma. So let's say I have a string, I, I have a, sorry, I have a tuple, I have switching back and forth between tuple and string. So I have a tuple u and I want to know whether it's in the relation or not. So let's do a round by round thing. The first round, uh, we want to check uh, whether u1 is in the projection of r onto the first coordinate or not. And if it is the case, I want to find also a witness. And this is really easy if we're given a witness function. You just look at this entry 1, u1. If it's nil, we already know it's not in the projection. If it's not nil, this entry is actually a witness. So after round one, we should have a tuple that is in R, and its first entry is U1. And let's call this string U1, uh, V2, and then W. And here comes round two. We'll do the same thing, but now for uh, coordinates one and two. I want to tell whether you know, U1, U2, is in the projection of R onto the first two coordinates or not. If it's not, I can already project. If it is, I want to again find a witness, function, uh, witness uh, tuple which is in R and start with uh, U1 and U2. Okay. So the first thing we would do is to look at this entry of um, uh, uh, witness function 2U2. If it's not, if it's nil, we can already reject. If it's not nil, then we can come look at these two strings, uh, omega two u two and omega two v two. And uh, they, if they have different first entries, so what we get from uh, these are two tuples that are in R, and we compare their first entries. If the first entries are different, uh, it tells us that uh, uh, U2, it tells us that U1, U2 cannot be in the projection of R onto the first two co coordinates. Because if it is, if it is in the projection, uh, then U1, U2 is in the projection. Uh, U1, V2 is also in the projection then U2 and V2 should be in the same equivalent class. They are equivalent on, uh, in the second coordinate. And by the definition of witness functions, uh, these two tuples should start with the same entry. Okay. So if it is this case, we can also reject. So the only case left that is that we have two strings, two tuples here and they start with the same first entry. Let's call them uh, W1 and then U2 and then something else. And W1, U2, sorry, W1, V2 and something else. And then you just run the same thing, put these 
three strings and the top one in the right order and then apply uh, the Marchev polymorphism. And we would get a new string in R that starts with U1, U2. So in this way, we not only know that U1, U2 is in the projection, we also have found a witness for that. And all we need to do is just repeat for, I think, n rounds to prove the first lemma. And if we want to prove the second lemma, just repeat for t rounds. So this is uh, why having a witness function is, is very useful. Um, but where does such a function come from? Um, suppose I have a, um, um, suppose I have a language uh, with a much of polymorphism C, and I'm given a CSP instance uh, which defines the relation R. Uh, according to what we have talked so far, having a witness function would be great, would definitely help. And this lemma tells us that you can actually construct one very efficiently in polynomial time. So I will not be able to give the proof here. Uh, it's, it, it has, I think, about two pages. Uh, roughly speaking, you start with the uh, empty instance with no constraint, which you know just trivial to construct a witness function. And then you j just add constraints one by one. After adding each constraint, you update the witness function to get a new witness function for the instance with this new constraint and repeat until you get the uh, CSP instance here. Okay. So with this, we can now uh, give the algorithm. Um, so remember, this is the goal. Uh, th this is the assumption. We have a language that is uh, strongly balanced. And because it's strongly balanced, it's strongly rectangular. So we have a much of polymorphism. And now we have a CSP instance, let's say, with n variables. And this is r is the relation that this instance defines. And we want to you know, compute the size of r. Um, let's define these functions where f bracket t has t variables, and the value is just the number of ways to complete it and to get a tuple in R. You can think about this, these f bracket t functions like you know, sum over the last variable and then sum over the n minus 1 variable. Of course, our goal is to compute something like f bracket 0 or f bracket 1. Um, but on the other hand, at the very beginning, what we only have is you know, how to compute, how to evaluate f bracket n, uh, which is just this relation. And as I mentioned earlier, um, it's actually very helpful to view these functions as, as each as a matrix. So we'll view f bracket t as the matrix with um, d to the t minus 1 rows and only D columns. Okay. So uh, the rows are indexed by you know, T minus one tuples. The columns are index, indexed by elements in the domain. And the entry is just the value of F bracket T. Um, and just notation-wise, I'll also use F bracket T X star to denote the the row vector indexed by x, where x is uh, t minus 1 tuple. So the main counting algorithm uses the following uh, data structures. So for now, it's not clear where these data structures come from. We'll build these data structures later. But let's assume for now that for each f bracket t, we have a data structure which you can query and will give you something back very efficiently. So for f bracket t, you can send a t minus 1 tuple x. Or you, know, you can send a row index here to the data structure. And the data structure uh, returns a vector, which is 0 if this row is 0. 
Otherwise, it returns you something that is non-zero and linearly dependent with the vector that you're interested in. It may not give you exactly that vector, but we'll promise to give you something linear dependent with the vector. And it turns out that with these data structures, uh, we can compute, uh, uh, let's say, f bracket 1 of a1 very efficiently. And then using you know, the definition, we can get the size of r very efficiently. Okay. And again, this algorithm runs round by round. So we want to compute f bracket 1 of a1. So clearly, I want to, uh, I would be very interested in f bracket 2 and uh, the a1th row. For example, if I know this vector, then I can just do the sum and get what I want. Okay. I have this data structure for f bracket t, so I can send this, this row index, uh, which is a one tuple a1. And this data structure, as promised earlier, would return a vector v. If v is 0, then I know this whole vector is 0. And this would be 0. Otherwise, uh, I get a vector v, which is uh, non-zero. And it's promised to be linearly dependent with the vector that I'm interested in. So take any non-zero, let's say the first non-zero entry of this vector. Uh, and we want to compute the sum of entries from this vector but we only know v, then you can just get this equation, uh, which uh, we know how to compute this using v. And it reduces the computation to uh, evaluating f bracket, t, uh, f bracket 2 at a1 and a2. So you have two linearly dependent vectors. You want to compute the sum of the first one. You are given the second one. Uh, it can be reduced to computing you know, one of the entries in the first vector. And you can repeat exactly the same thing. Uh, now I want to compute f bracket 2, a1, a2. Naturally, I would query the data structure for the row index by a1, a2. And I would get a row vector that is linearly dependent with the vector that I'm interested in. And the, the same argument reduces to evaluating this entry of f bracket 3. Okay. So the key thing is that uh, the branching factor is 1. Every time we uh, want to evaluate, let's say, an entry of f bracket t, we can make a query on uh, the data structure for t plus 1, and then it reduces the computation to evaluating uh, one entry of f bracket t plus 1. And doing this for n rounds, um, it suffices for us to compute, to evaluate f bracket n. And this is just you know, deciding whether this tuple is in relation r or not. It's 1 if it's in the relation, 0 otherwise. And this we know how to decide given the input instance. When you have the input instance, you have a particular assignment. It's easy to decide whether it satisfies all the constraints or not. Okay. So this is the main counting algorithm. And clearly, the best of the proof is just to, to say you know, when it's uh, strongly balanced, when the language is strongly balanced, we can actually build these data structures very efficiently. And then combining these data structures with this main counting algorithm, we would get the trackability part of the proof. And so how to... Uh, build these data structures. Here is the uh, first observation. Uh, because the, the language is strongly balanced, I already know that these matrices are block rank one matrices, because these uh, matrices are just special cases of the matrices uh, we discussed in the definition of strong balance. Right? The, the special case when the second block has length one, has only one variable. So this is the picture for block rank one matrices. We have a few blocks, at most d of them, and the rest is 0. And furthermore, uh, it, it's closely related to the equivalence classes of this equivalence relation. So let's, let's take this block, this green one, and let's say the columns are 1, 2, 3. 
take any row index here, x, which is a t minus 1 tuple, then we know that all these three entries are positive. What does it mean? It means uh, given x and 1, you can complete it and get a tuple in the language. With x2, you can also complete it and get a tuple in the language, which tell us that 1 and 2 are equivalent under this equivalence relation, just by definition. And this tells us actually all these three should be in the same equivalence class. And it also holds the other direction. If you have an equivalence class, uh, it should give you columns of one of the blocks. Okay. So there is a natural one-to-one -one correspondence between equivalence classes of this relation and blocks of this matrix. So each uh, equivalence class corresponds to columns of one of these blocks. And the next thing is that it's not only that each of these blocks are positive, they're rank one. Right? Because they're rank one. All I need is to kind of store one of the row vectors here. And whenever a query comes in, if I know this query belongs to the screen vector, the screen uh, block, then I can just return that vector I stored for you. And that, that vector would be linearly dependent uh, with the row vector that you're interested in. Okay, so this is what we call a representative vector for each block. So, um, and each block corresponds to an equivalence class. So let's say uh, we have a representative vector vj for each equivalence class ej. Okay. So representative vector is just a vector that is linearly dependent with you know, all the row vectors in the corresponding block. And I claim that once you have computed a representative vector for each of these block or each of these equivalence classes, the data structure is ready. Whenever you have a query, I can answer that query. I can give you a right vector very efficiently in polynomial time. So how do you do that? Uh, whenever we have a query x, let's just decide you know, which block it belongs to. Or maybe it's, it belongs here. You know, It's all zero. Now to decide, for example, whether it belongs to the green block, uh, let's say I want to know whether x belongs to the green block or not. All I need to do is to check whether x1, f bracket t x1, is uh, 0 or not. And this, that's the same as asking whether x1 is in the projection of r onto the first t coordinates or not. And that we know how to answer using a witness function for r. So we can answer this very efficiently, repeat this for each block. We can tell which block it comes from, or it doesn't come from any of the blocks. If it doesn't come from any of the blocks, we return 0. Otherwise, we, we return the representative vector for that block. Okay. So this finishes everything, uh, almost everything we want about these data structures, which tells us that all we need is to find a representative vector for each of these blocks and store in the data structure. And whenever a query comes in, we can you know, decide which vector to return. The last piece is just to build these data structures backwards one by one. So let's start with the data structure for, uh, for f bracket n. This is easy because I know how to evaluate this, this function efficiently. It's basically just the, the relation r. So first of all, using the equivalence class, I can you know, compute all the equivalence. Sorry, using the witness function, I can compute all the equivalence classes. Now, for each equivalence class, let's say this one, uh, you can use the witness function to get a witness tuple, and then just evaluate the, the whole row um, indexed by x, and use that row as the representative, representative vector. Okay. You can use this, this row as the representative vector for this block. And this takes you know, d evaluations of the f bracket n function, which is you know, affordable because um, we have the input instance. 
You can do this exactly the same thing for f bracket t. First of all, figure out the equivalence classes using the witness function. Uh, then for each equivalence class, just evaluate one row here and use it as a representative vector. The only difference is that we don't know how to directly evaluate f bracket t compared to f bracket n. But it turns out that you, know, you can use this basically the same counting algorithm, but assuming that we already have access to data structures t plus 1 through n, you can actually evaluate f bracket t efficiently. Earlier, I showed you how to evaluate f bracket 1 if I have 2 through n. But the same thing holds if you have data structures for t plus 1 through n and you want to evaluate f bracket t. And now this really completes everything about the algorithm part of the, the dichotomy theorem. For the non-negative CSP, it turns out everything here can be generalized to get a dichotomy theorem for non-negative CSP, and I, you know, the algorithm just works exactly the same. Uh, the only difference we need is that we need to also to extend the uh, strong balance condition. Um, so we have now a non-active language, and here are the functions, here are the matrices that we're interested in. Take any instance, uh, we get a function, and again, partition the variables into three parts, and we get this matrix. Um, the only difference is that instead of counting you know, how many Ws uh, to get a tuple in R, which is summing over all the Ws here. And the strong balance condition says that every such matrix should be block rank one. Uh, and if that happens, the language is uh, solvable in polynomial time, otherwise it it's, shall be hard. So uh, I have 10 minutes, but I will use that to uh, give you some ideas behind the uh, uh, dichotomy for CSP with complex values. Uh, the first difference is now we have cancellations. And this is the observation where uh, things start to uh, become a little bit, little bit different. Uh, so take a, take a complex valued language and take an instance. Um, we can define this relation, you know, x is in R, if and only if fx is non-zero. Okay, now we only can, we can only say non-zero versus zero. And similarly, we can define this function f bracket t, which is just sum over uh, uh, all the variables except the first t variables. Now the difference is that uh, in the non-active or zero one case, given a witness function for this relation r, I can use it to tell you know, efficiently whether this entry is uh, zero or positive once I have a witness function. But now I cannot because uh, even if I have some non-zero entries here, uh, I may get cancellation in this, is this sum, and this entry may still be zero. Okay. But we will still use the, main, the same counting algorithm based on the same data structures. Uh, it's exactly the same data structures. Um, given a query, the data structure returns in polynomial time uh, 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 a, tuple, a, a row vector that is either zero if the vector we're interested in is all zero, or returns something non-zero and linearly in, uh, dependent with the vector we're interested in. And uh, the same algorithm would go through once we have uh, built such data structures. So here are the difficulties in building such data structures. So the first thing is we may need to store a lot of representative vectors. So I, I, in general, if you have a, uh, if you have a M by D matrix, it could be the case like every two rows are linearly independent. So if we want to store all the representative vectors, like if suppose you want to store a vector 
a bunch of vectors so that every vector in this matrix is linearly dependent with one of them, you may store you know, the whole matrix, which is, is too many because we may have d to the t minus one many vectors. Okay. And here is a, a hint from uh, the works on, on counting graph homomorphisms where we have talked about you know, matrices with uh, uh, pairwise orthogonal uh, row vectors. These are basically a large part of the tractable cases. And the uh, wishful thinking is what if we can impose the condition that every two rows of this matrix S, F bracket T are either linearly dependent or orthogonal. Okay. If that's the case, at least you know, number wise, I only need to store at most the D many representative vectors. And it turns out that we can actually impose this condition uh, because we can show that uh, if the language violates this condition, then the problem is already sharply hot. Okay. And the next thing is, okay, this, what we talked about, simplify the picture a little bit. Now we only have at most D many blocks. Um, each block has, you know, pairwise, uh, each block is like uh, rank one. Uh, the next question is, uh, how can I answer a query? So let's say a query comes in. To answer this query, I have to tell uh, whether it belongs to the red block or the blue block or the yellow block or it doesn't belong to any block. If I can answer that, I can return the corresponding representative vector. But it's not clear how to answer this question, but what if all these sets, each of these sets, each of these SJ has a much of polymorphism? If that's the case, uh, and if we can compute a witness function for each of these sets, then we can use the witness function to answer queries, membership queries like these. Okay. So this is the second condition, the, the Malchev condition, uh, which requires basically that all such sets should have a witness function. So it should, have a, uh, should share the same Malchev polymorphism. And again, if it violates this condition, then the problem is, is sharply hot. Okay. So we're almost there. We know, how to, uh, we know how many representative vectors we need at most uh, D. We also know that if you can compute a witness function for each of these blocks, the data structure is ready. Okay. So the last piece is how to do the backwards induction, you know, compute this um, these vectors and then the witness functions for f bracket n, move on to f bracket n minus one and do this one by one. And it turns out there are some technical difficulties like we don't know how to do that unless assuming this condition, which roughly speaking allows us to manipulate relations that share a much of polymorphism. And we can afford to make this assumption because again, otherwise uh, the language would be sharply hot. And with this condition, we can do the induction efficiently. So putting all the things together, uh, the block orthogonality condition tells us that uh, there are only at most the D blocks. The Malchev condition tells that you can, uh, if, if you can compute the witness function for each of these blocks, uh, you, can, you, you can use them to answer membership queries. And the type partition condition tells us how to build these data structures, these vectors and witness functions one by one backwards. So the theorem says that if the language satisfies all these conditions, then uh, the problem is in polynomial time. Otherwise, if it violates any of these three conditions, it's, it's sharply hard. So this is everything about the dichotomy. And here is the thing I said earlier, like why I feel like it's a, it's a hammer, uh, because, um, because it's not as explicit as you know, counting graph homomorphisms, and it's not as explicit as uh, dichotomy for non-negative CSP. So if we're given a, a language and we're interested in deciding you know, whether this language, uh, which case this language falls into, whether it's easy to solve or hard to solve. All the graph homomorphism papers uh, have a very explicit condition, which you can just follow step by step and check whether uh, it's an easy to solve problem or hard problem. For a non-active CSP, 
it's a little more difficult, but it's still in MP. And uh, for the complex CSP, uh, it's, we, we don't even know if it's uh, decidable or not. Uh, and uh, just as to point like what we know, I, I, don't, I think we don't even know whether this condition is necessary or not. Um, for example, I don't have an example where you know, this condition is violated and you have to make, impose this condition. And this is Jingyi's take. I think this was three years o uh, ago, but I don't know whether you have updated this or not. And the other thing is uh, uh, whether it's possible to apply some of the ideas elsewhere, like Holland problems or uh, approximation CSP. I, uh, I have no idea how whether this is doable, but it would be cool if some of the things here can be extended. Okay, thanks. So you have three conditions. You're saying it's not uh, known to be decidable. Which ones are not, decided, not known to be decidable? The last one? None of them. No. <laughs> right, right. Um. They are all applied to a, a clone, if you will, in a set generated by all possible things. Every one of them applied to infinite. The multiple is it a little like. Your one? How does the multiple one differ from the structure? The, the multiple? Um, because of the cancellations, yeah. That might be zeros in the matrix that you want to Rather, there might be uh, tuples that have weight zero because of an inner solution. Do you have any evidence that I think it's probably I would bear down that it's decidable, but I don't know how to prove it. <laughs> well, I hope it's decidable. <laughs> It'd be kind of cool if it wasn't. You would If we can prove it's undecidable, yeah, that would be <laughs> really cool. Yeah. What wishes? Yes.